And as everyone knows, we abide by the patent policy and only people and companies listed on this link are allowed to make substantive contributions. Purpose of the meeting is to decide on issues blocking the final candidate recommendation of over to CPC. We're also trying to make progress on stats and privacy issues. And we expect to reissue a CR of Weber to CPC and stats after this meeting. Some basic info. If you're here, you probably know this. And the slides are up on the wiki. And this meeting is now being recorded. So this is what we're trying to do today. A number of issues on Weber to CPC, stats, and media capture. So uh, this is on the agenda. So do you want to talk to it, Henrik? Uh, do we want need a scribe? We do need a scribe, actually. Do we have a scribe? Is Dom here? No. Hmm. So who's going to be the scribe? That is a very good question. Karim. Karim, will you be the scribe? <laughs> Karin, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Will you be the scribe? Uh, sure, I can scribe in IRC. OK, thank you. OK, Henrik? All right, uh, so uh, a number of features have been moved. Um, the the at risk features as well as uh, since we've had a feature freeze we've we've said oh any anything that's it's anything has been moved to the extensions uh, to a separate spec and I ended up just creating one on my personal GitHub uh, so it it's at WebRTC extension we have um, the following at risk features have been moved there the git get default ice servers max frame rate and OAuth, there's also some uh, new features there, like the play out delay hint and adaptive p-time. And, and there's other discussions that I haven't gone through yet. But um, I'm wondering if the working group would like to adopt the extension spec. Um, basically, I want, I want future discussions to uh, well, it needs a working group. It needs a home, so that it's not just my opinion. I would be in favor of adopting it. I guess the understanding is it would just be an editor's draft, and then when we go to uh, ask for a working group, working draft, people could comment on it. Yes. Yeah, so this is not a mature spec. It just it's a spec that needs a home. Yeah, there's probably no better home than this working group. <coughs> uh, I well, think it's it's also fine to have WebRTC extension spec there. Uh, I would tend to think that it would remain a working draft forever. And whenever uh, a feature like is shipping, then we could put it in WebRTC PC if, that, if it makes more sense. If it, if it does not make more sense, we can leave it there. But uh, yeah, so, some of these features might end up going in WebRTC PC, so. Yeah, if they get implemented. Yeah. If they get implemented, could we just, after we ship WebRTC 1.0 uh, CR, make a WebRTC 1.1 or with those yeah. features? Yeah. Which are minor additions. Uh, I would think right. we can do living standard, basically, so. Oh, that, yeah. that's, what, that's what we're all hoping, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So okay. Uh, we seem to have consensus to adopt. Mm -hmm. Good. Then Dom can rename, uh, take care of renaming the repo. Yeah. Okay. Great. And it does magic. Okay. Done. Okay. So let's get into the things we want to discuss today. Um, Oops. Harold? Yep. Okay. I'll start with the Sun Codex thing. 
And the nice thing about this particular issue is that it seems to have gone away from completely different reasons. I mean, the issue focused on the fact that the payload type was was being updated in an inconsistent manner between two different records. And now it's gone from one of them, so it's not the problem anymore. Mm. Maybe. And uh, so, and so uh, I propose that we close this issue and saying that this is not a precise problem and uh, let's open a new one. And of course, Henrik took up the challenge. So okay. let's, let's get rid of this one first. Uh, does anyone uh, object to closing the issue? Well, I'm, I'm, uh, our FTP guy is uh, away this week, so I wasn't able to get 100% uh, feedback from him that this is actually resolved. Um, but there's um, so even if the payload type values cannot change, their meaning cannot change. Um, can the actual uh, value change uh, from the negotiation? Uh, no. Well, you, no. You, uh, as I understand it, uh, you can add more codecs, more payload types with the same codec. That's perfectly legal and done all the time. Yeah. And just different parameters often. Uh, but uh, once you've assigned the payload type to a codec, you can't, uh, it's, it, it'll always be that codec. You can't reuse it ever. All right. No, I think it's good to close the issue, and then I'll ask uh, our guy to reopen the issue if it's still an issue. OK. Yeah. Sounds and good course, to me. Uh, uh, Henrik immediately took up the challenge and uh, and uh, and uh, file a new issue, which is on like with which I then put on the next slide. Okay, so uh, just to make sure, two three one three is closed, and we have consensus. Okay, two three six nine. And yeah, yeah. Uh, so this problem is uh, rather more actual. I mean. Per spec, receive codex is only set when uh, the type is answer or peer answer. And either, yeah, that's right. uh, either in the local or, or, or in the remote answer. But uh, that means that when we're doing the offer, it's null or it's a previous yeah. value. Because the reason it's a, bu it's a bug, I mean, uh, strictly speaking, what in some receive codex isn't uh, affecting anything down in the machinery, but uh, uh, it's confusing not to have it right. Because with, when we offer a new payload type in a renegotiation, it's possible that the answer to that offer gets delayed so long that uh, the media sent with a new payload type arrives before, before we see the, the answer. Right. And uh, we know what payload type it is because we we created it. Uh, but uh, it's uh, it seems rather silly not to show it to the to to the user that this uh, this is the codec type for that. And the and the logical place to show that is in re, in receive codex. Yeah. Therefore, I'm suggesting that we just move the receive codex uh, setting part out of the if description is answer block, saying that we do this for every offer and answer. Yeah. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, the only thing that's a little bit weird is if you're doing something like send only. Um, yeah, what's weird about it? I mean, do we have a receiver? Yeah, in that case, uh, well, do do we? If you doing if direction is send only, would you have a receiver? Yes, you would. Yeah, you probably okay. would. It just wouldn't. Yeah, just wouldn't. But you set the receive codex to the codex in the description of, uh, negotiated for receiving, and I mean, I guess if 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 you're negotiating not to receive anything, that should be an empty list. Maybe yeah. there's room for interpretation if, if you actually include something or not. But yeah, that that uh, that seems lo seems logical. Uh, I mean, adding a comment to the to the sentence saying that uh, this means that if you're 
if you're send only, uh, the, the list is empty. Yeah. That's interesting. But otherwise, makes makes sense. So because because early media is possible, I you can you can receive media before uh, you see right. receive the answer. Then I think you should see which codex you are willing to receive even yep. before you, you set the answer. It it makes sense. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I think we should uh, do this. Yep. Okay. Sure. I notice that as, as accepted. And I'll uh, create a PR for it. So now we're starting at IFL. All right, I guess Any this bar? is me. Yes. This is you. All right, so uh, set parameters and get parameters has some racy behavior. And uh, there are two problems. And I wanted to talk about this one first, but it's already called A and B in the on the GitHub repo, so I'm still calling it B here. <clears throat> so the first problem is that get parameters is not really a true uh, getter in that it has mm -hmm. side effects because it yep. bumps the transaction ID every time you call it. So if you, for instance, do this where you call it, then you call some unrelated function that internally you know, also calls get parameters for an unrelated reason, when you come back to the main uh, function loop and you try to set the parameters, you get an you can get an invalid state error based on logic in that function, in this mm -hmm. case bar. So that's one problem that doesn't seem good. The other one is that uh, we can also have a race <clears throat> with a remote simulcast offer if you get parameters and then you wait a little bit and then you call set parameters because and that's because when when set remote description gets a simulcast offer, it clears the internal slot that we return, which causes uh, uh, set parameters to fail because it says the parameters are not the ones the last got. So how do we solve this next slide? <clears throat> so the solution that I came up with is to queue a task in get parameters to clear the internal slot, last return parameters. And uh, in addition, only increment transaction ID when this internal slot is null. Uh, so this creates an envelope, basically, that get parameters that you have to use get param your get parameters in if you want to call set parameters. <clears throat> so it solves B. Uh, it's now a getter with no discernible side effects, which means you can call get parameters, call some unrelated function without worrying that it calls get parameters because we don't uh, bump the transaction ID. So set parameters still always works rather than fail intermittently. So, so here's a problem. Sure. If some unrelated function calls set parameters. Hmm. Well, the, the unrelated function in this case is a synchronous function. If it calls an asynchronous fun, uh, set parameters is asynchronous. So it's actually not possible to change the parameters synchronously. All you're doing is um, you know, when the parameters, the parameters can only change asynchronously, basically. So that, this works. That, so that works, but also I would argue that if you have an unrelated function that calls set parameters, it's not really an unrelated function. Hmm. Yeah, so, yeah. So you're saying that uh, that in inside, the, uh, so that between tasks, uh, all functions will necessarily return the same get parameters? Yes. The same values of get parameters? Yes. OK. And so that that, uh, that means that you say that set parameters can only be called in the same uh, um, execution yeah. block that uh, gets it. Effectively, yes. 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 So well, that's that, the intention. That was, was uh, that last time we, when we designed this uh, transaction mechanism, that was uh, felt to be so uh, so obnoxious that uh, we, that we said uh, no, we won't do that. And that's right. why we met the transaction ID. Right. Unfortunately, the transaction ID is obnoxious in different ways. Right. Which is, uh, <laughs> it's a so it's a choice of choice of obnoxiousness. Yes. And uh, one of them is backwards compatible, and the other is not. That's yeah. So so w one question. Um... Why cannot we bump the transaction ID when the parameters are actually modified? Meaning when you set some things or you set parameters or you uh, apply a remote description or you do something like that. Why cannot we do that? 
<clears throat> well, if we go back to the uh, previous slide, then we have these problems. Uh, uh, none of these problems are uh, so okay. So that would solve the problem B, is what you're saying. If we only incremented when the value changed. So if but, we, so if we, so that would require us to store store all the parameters and then compare them. Yes. So yes, that, that would be another option for B. But it would not solve problem A, which is that we have racy behavior with um, might, negotiation. Might not be a. It might not be a problem. A might not be a problem actually. Uh, if you're doing get parameters and then you're modifying your object and you're trying to set parameters on, on a modified object, it might be good to actually uh, throw. I mean, if they, well, if it, I mean this, this, was actually, this was actually considered a feature at the time. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. What, what I don't I, like I, about I, it. I, I mean, if you did call sys edit, sys, uh, set remote description, right, you would want uh, in mm -hmm. A, you would want it to fail. Exactly. Yeah. Well. The, the reason I don't like it is if you use a perfect negotiation or if you just use on negotiation needed to abstract away negotiation, the assumption is that you can then call these high level methods uh, on the pair connection object without uh, worrying about signaling state at all. And, and this breaks that because it'll work most of the time, but some of the time it'll fail and it'll, it won't be obvious. What just happened was that uh, you happen to race with negotiation, which was happening in the background, so yeah. to speak. Well, you would, but uh, you would know, right? Because basically, you mm -hmm. would know that something changed it, and that's why it failed. Yeah. So well, you, you would wait. You would know after the fact that it fails. Yes. Yeah. I, I do think it's a, a foot gun. Um, I think when you think about rollback and rolling back received codecs, which there is a future slide for, um, there's more reason to. Right. I mean. There's more reasons that it could fail. Uh, you could say that's a feature, but I, is it useful to be able to get parameters and then change stuff and then it fails? It seems like the, the safe and most straightforward and user-friendly way to use this API is to call get parameters and then call set parameters in the same task. And I don't see any reason to, to allow other ways to use this. It's, it's like we have plenty of foot guns in WebRTC, right. and this is one foot gun less. Like, hey, that's good. I don't see us losing any real use case from <laughs> disallowing this. Uh -huh. uh, at the same t at the same time, I would say that uh, it's not necessarily obvious that when you call get parameters, you immediately have uh, with your solutions to call set parameters immediately without any a weight on anything because maybe you have some legitimate reasons to call some asynchronous function in your logic code mm. and then it doesn't work anymore there might right. be some existing code right now based on the old behavior that is actually doing that properly yeah logging for instance and yeah for yes. some logging or for some things and then it would break but here here's my point about that that code is racy Mm. Right. Not necessarily. Well, if you ever get a well, if it's not doing simulcast, maybe. But if it, if it gets a simulcast incoming offer, you could intermittently get an error for this. Where but maybe yeah. it's just maybe it's just calculating the the proper parameters, initially setting setting them into into init encodings of your of the trans um, transceiver add transceiver parameters. So all the parameters are good from the start. It does the negotiation, and after that, oh. Context change in the call. I'm going to set the parameters. Then there's not necessarily a new negotiation happening, and then still same thing. Um, that code could be written, and you would break that. The, the other thing that I might raise. Uh, well, what we have here is this construct of uh, get the parameters, which is synchronous, and then modify them and set them back. Now think about if you have this being done on a button click or something, you could actually have this race against other iterations of itself, right? So it's it's kind of, it's risky to get a copy of something and then wait a little bit and then set it back. That's the yeah. that's the definition of a race, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, I agree the, the API, the get parameters, set parameters API is not great uh, at all, but uh, right. we, we so should yeah. shift it yeah. somehow. So. 
but JavaScript was supposed to be the antidote and not have races the way other programming languages have. And here we're we're defining an API that has those. Yeah, we're kind we're, we're kind of this uh, rediscovering that JavaScript uh, do doesn't live up to its promises. Yeah. Right. Right. It lives up to the capital promise. Angular. Well, <laughs> if you prefer race C plus plus code, I would agree with you. But the we call the future and never change. Yeah. I mean, anyway, if it, 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 I mean, the big, big question seems to be whether or not we we can limit the uh, set parameters to be called in the same function block by the same task. Hmm. It might be worth experimenting. I I think it's a good idea. I think it's a good yeah. idea, but I think it might break some <laughs> code to do such a change now. I so we need to be cautious and probably try to see if there's actually anyone doing that right now in the code in the application. Um, so I would try to get some numbers on, on that. In the essence, it's a good idea, but it needs to be made maybe more obvious uh, in the API that it is happening, that you need to do it directly. You, you, could, you could have a sensible error message when you implement this. Well, it would be very obvious. If you go to the second slide again, since I didn't get to cover solution A there, uh, basically, why don't I see the whole slide? Yeah, so basically, it would always fail. So it would be quite obvious that uh, this is required. So we we'll probably have to introduce it by the usual way of uh, setting up a use counter and uh, and counting the use counting the usage, the sending a dep deprecation message, and then and then the re uh, then starting to fail it. Mm. Yeah, it's possible. The usual the usual way. It's doable. It's just like need to be careful about making such a change. Yeah. And, um, in your solution, you say that you want to only increment the transaction ID when last return parameters in, is null. That's only in which context exactly? Well, uh, well that's the part get parameters, that, right? That's the part that solves B basically. That if there's if you're in the same task and uh, there's no <laughs> um, basically, if we queue a task and null out the last parameters, then that means if last parameters is not null, it means we're in the same task. Or, I mean, uh, yes. Basically, I hesitate don't to complicate. Implement it multiple times if you've already called get parameters. Is what it right. says. Yeah, so the so so the reason for having the transaction ID at all is that uh, it's the way we can detect the uh, if someone gets param does get parameters and then waits a bit and then set, does set parameters. And it will succeed if the parameters have not changed, but if the transaction ID has changed, then right. we can see that is a change. So then that's required for the, the solution to A to always fail. It took me a while to see that. So I think we. It sounds like we have consensus that we want we want this to be the spe specified behavior, and that but it it will take implementations a while to get there. Should we yeah, add yeah. to the spec saying that uh, uh, there's some backwards compatible uh, code? There might be a backwards compatible code that may, means it doesn't fail at once. Probably. Probably. So, so, uh, so uh, is there two implementations that are planning to do that soon, I guess? Or in, in, in I guess, Chrome Canary, you would ship it very soon and, and Firefox beta as well? We'd ship a deprecation counter some, sometime. Yeah. I don't know if we get it done in December, but. Okay. Yeah, we'll have to find back. Yeah. Also, um, one thing that I see in your solution, you say increment transaction ID. In which situation do we say that transaction ID is a number? We should probably not say increment, just change. Okay. 
So yeah. right now, Rotate. transaction ID for me is a UID, a random string. Yeah, this was a slide uh, uh, simplification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to make sure that we don't have increments in the final paper. Okay. Just change. So the the program. action item is to create a PR. That's good. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. <coughs> so, um, the, an issue here is if can Simulcast offers renegotiate uh, RIDs, RIDs? And we looked at JSAP and it says offers and answers inside an existing session follow the rules of initial negotiation. Such an offer may propose a change in the number of RIDs in use. But to avoid races with media, any RIDs with proposed changes should use a new ID rather than reusing one of the previous uh, values. And RIDs without proposed changes should, uh, without changes, should uh, reuse these in the old IDs. So that's from remote offers. And that differs from the local side where for ad transceiver, we say once the envelope for simulcast is determined, layers cannot be removed. And maybe that difference is fine. Um, because we can't really control what comes in a, into a remote offer, and we don't have that many options for actually, like just flat out uh, uh, rejecting as if remote offers are invalid is, is a poor, poor choice. So we have to do something. So for interop, so we could leave this as is and leave user agents to come up with something, or we could for interop, we could have WebRTC PC dictate stronger requirements for how implementations must respond to this. So if we want to do that, then the proposed suggestions here, you know, I don't have a good PR here, I'm just uh, posing questions. So once send encoding's length is more than one, basically, when we have simulcast, right. then if another incoming simulcast offer comes in, what do we do? And how do we interpret this <laughs> update to our encodings? So the options that I see, is to, and this, these may not all be compliant with JSAP, so, but just to have all the options, ignore all changes to existing encodings, that's one option. Uh, we can update the encodings and their order based on the matching RITs. And then I have a question there whether order is significant um, in our API, I forget. Or we can update encodings based on order uh, mm -hmm. that would allow you to move uh, red values around. But no other. But otherwise, don't allow renaming, or just erase all encodings and replace with new ones. And I broke out a separate question of what do we do with uh, new, new encodings that we discover, no matter how we discover them, based on whether the IDs are new or whether there are more than there was before. Uh, do we uh, add those new encodings or do we ignore them? And similarly, for removing things, basically things that are that we had before but are not in the new offer, do we remove? Missing encodings, do we leave them alone or do we maybe set active to false? I don't know. Discuss. My gut reaction, so take that with a grain of salt, is that the order is significant. So if you have A and B and then you have B and A, what you've done is you've renamed A to B and you've renamed B to A. Um, and uh, it's completely horrible given that uh, when the packet comes in with red A, you oh, yeah, that's you horrible. Can tell where it's right. before or after the, the name change. Right, but like that's yeah. the you should use a new ID part, which I think yeah, you that, should. I, I think I think we should. Uh, I I think that should have been a must. Mm. Right, but um. But a must does only uh, dictates what you emit. It doesn't. We, we cannot dictate what input we get in. Only how we behave, behave to it. So we still have to decide if someone sends us SDP that says these things. Like, I want if the if the uh, if the input is A B C. I want I want the encoding uh, parameters to return order A B C. Um, right. Yeah, I, I think you basically have a problem with resolving glare here. Because say you do air transceiver, add a bunch of encoding, set local, and then you find, oh, I got another I got a remote offer. Now you've got a problem because uh, you can't really roll it back. Yeah, 
you can't roll back what you said in that transceiver. Well, this is the You're question right. I should. I, mean, I don't think it's not about it's not about rollback, but let's say uh, you did this. What should happen? Uh, should the remote I mean, offer? I mean, we could decide that the remote offer gets to totally trash what we said in that transceiver. Hang on. What what do implementations do uh, with this? Do we just reject the SDP, or does magic happen? <laughs> well, I, I think I think uh, Ivan, we should probably try it out, Henrik. But the problem, like, here's a weird example. Say you set three uh, three encodings in set local, right? You did Andrews, you set three, and then you get an offer for two, mm -hmm. right? Um, you you do rollback. Um, uh, uh, and what will happen? I, I doubt this will succeed, will it? I mean, well, rollback would just use whatever it used before, I guess. Right, yeah, because you already, you already created three encodings in a transceiver, right? So ro rolling it back, you, you still have a contradiction between the offer and the, and the existing encodings. We should try it, but I suspect it, it errors. Well, I guess it's not totally true that the if if you're I think the way we the reason we added this in add transceiver was to simplify and say you create the layers once. If you right. want different layers, you know, stop that transceiver and create a new one. That's the mm -hmm. local solution. If, if if that's what we want, then we should just reject, right? Do what does think? that mean to reject an offer? Uh, throw an exception. You don't set it. Well, that's if we want the, if we want the layers to be well, yeah, but well, how about the question? Do we do we want to be able to support reconfiguring add transceivers uh, with SDP, but not with API? I'd prefer to reject it because uh, making it's life uh, making life more complicated for ourselves seems seems, seems like a, like a bad option. Yeah, we've been, uh, we've been spending so many cycles on simulcasts that uh, yeah. al allowing random complication be because of usages that we don't really think makes sense doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, unless we have a use case that we're trying to support, then I think to be consistent with add transceiver, we should just reject. Well, uh, yeah, reject it, what though? But so this is so I think I agree that uh, calling add transceiver and setting up uh, encodings, and then simultaneously allowing simulcast offers from the other side, that's an edge case we don't need to support. Yeah, that so wouldn't happen about, very often. Yeah. Right. But what about uh, a an SFU that sends you one simulcast offer, and then a few seconds later it sends you a different one, and yeah. it added a, it added another layer, it removed a layer, or uh, yeah, it that that can, ha that can happen if the conference participants change. My that thought can is if the if the M section has been associated with a transceiver, then the, the it's fixed. Well, JSEP does say that um, uh, such an offer may propose a change in the number of RIDs. Do we want to disallow that? I suggest we do. All right. Hmm. I, I don't have a strong stake, so others need to protest. Yeah, I don't think you would change, like, I don't think the SFU would change the number of RIDs in the offer. It would change the number of M lines because the participants change, but it wouldn't change the RITs. If we want to reach PR, we should not uh, add features that we don't have a use case for. Yeah, I don't think we have a use case for this. So, so we let's have to, do it. Yeah. it, it can, we can do. We can shove it off to an extension spec if if anyone comes up with a valid use case for this. But, but here's the issue, though. Uh, this is still valid JSEP. So we don't have any statement that says 
So but rejecting it can be can mean ignoring it. That's an option, or it can mean uh, failing the set remote description method. We can That's always it. say Fail. execute the steps of JSEP, except if the reads change, then abort. Or ignore. Abort because abort. If, abort. If, abort. The, yeah. if the other guy, if the other guy is, has uh, is working on the assumption that we have changed the reads and we haven't, then uh, all hell's going to break out, break loose. The aborting is a safer option. So set, and we set, we've set, said uh, we said fail. this before in other places in the spec where we say you know f must follow the process generating offer described in JSEP except the user agent must treat stopping transceiver as blah 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 like we we've done amend we've amended JSEP with a sentence like that and we could do the same for this. Mm. Yeah. The only reason we're not finding a bug against JSEP is because JSEP is frozen in anticipation for publishing. Right. Yeah, but in this case, we don't really have to contradict JSEP either. It says an offer may. That's only about what you produce. It's not what comes in, right? So this normative language is, is not relevant on inputs. So um, I don't know if there's a similar JSEP language for how to treat input, but it's going to be valid probably. Mm -hmm. Yes, we, we can do that. Mm -hmm. Um, so can someone state exactly what we're what we're what we've concluded here for the record? We conclude that we if if the rates change in an incomer coming offer, we reject the offer. Okay, Karine, have you got that? Reject is not it's a dubious word here. So uh, the the set remote description operation will fail with a will fail with a, with a suitable uh, suitable error. It will fail and it will not have applied the description. Right. Next slide. Okay. Filed. Okay, that's me again. Oh, yes. Uh, so, I looked carefully at the completed state, and it says that there are five conditions in order to have, have the completed state be, be the state be completed. Has to have finished gathering, has to have received an indication of the number of remote candidates, which Chrome doesn't support, so we never so we never get there. Finished checking all candidates pairs and found the connection. So five connections, five conditions. So uh, if it finds a candidate pair that's working, it goes to checking. Mm -hmm. It goes to it, it goes to connect it, and so that it, then it doesn't go to checking from checking to completed. But in the case where the last candidate pair is checks, like if there's only one, uh, if there's only one, uh, then it's possible that all the other things happened before. Uh, I mean, it's not possible in Chrome, but uh, due to our other bug, but it, it's possible that, that all the other conditions could be satisfied before we finish checking last candidate. And in that case, I think we have found the state where it goes to check from checking to completed. So, I think the answer is yes, and we should add a pack, add a, add a note to the spec to to say this might happen. Um, cons I agree with that. Cons um, you can view completed as a subset of connected. So yes. it's not it's not really it's not two different states. Like if you see a chain of states that you visit, like it's. When you reach there, you're completed. There's there's no intermediate state. Well, the states are mutually exclusive. If, if we're talking about the same completed text that's exposed. Well, okay, that's 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 true. It may be poorly defined, but that's yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I I agree with the the proposal to add a note. Okay, I'll make it yeah. here. 
So, okay. So, so com uh, completed means completed but not connected. Is that fair? No. no, it, uh, no. no when it, when you're completed, you're also connected. With it, you're, right. When you're completed, you are connected. So the difference. So you have a working condition. Working. Com yeah, because it says condition. found the connection. Okay. Connected okay. means connected means you 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 are connected, but you have more pairs to check. And completed means you are connected yeah. and you don't have any more pairs to to check. Right. Thanks. Yeah, I got it backwards. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Next step is to prepare a PR. Okay. Yeah. And right, so uh, we investigated the, the life cycle of transports. Uh, I made a code pen, and it's uh, indeed asymmetrical in that if you are the offers, the transports are created at set local description. And if you are the answer, the, the transports are created at set remote description uh, answer. And the, the reason that we have this asymmetry is for the early media use case, so uh, or and for bundling as well. So so you could you could offer, and in case the other endpoint doesn't support bundling, you will have uh, several transports created, and then when you receive the answer, um, all the additional transports will go away if bundling was supported, because you only need one transport, and if bundling wasn't supported, you'll keep all the transports uh, alive. Mm -hmm. Well, what this means is that um, the transports you have when you're in the have local offer state are really just transports that are on offer. And so like all the following slides will be about rollback. So the, the, if you have something that's on offer that might not apply, yeah, you have to you have to remove those when you roll back. And right now we don't update the, the transport internal slots when we roll back. So the proposal is to remember the the transport slots uh, that they were in the stable state, and if you roll back, then you do revert the transport to that value. So, in the in most cases, this would go back to null. Yep. But it could go back to uh, the previous transport. Mm -hmm. So, so this makes early sense. Media, yeah. Early media can't happen on initial negotiation. Is that right? No. Um, well, in any yeah, yeah, but you can think of the bundling case. The, the point is, um, the point is when you you ha when you have an offer, you may have a temporary transport object, and if you roll back, then you you would remove the transport because it wouldn't exist anymore. The, right, right. The transport is created as part of the offer, so if we roll back, um, if we roll back anything that was caused by an offer, then we have to roll back transports. Right. It, it seems a little uh, ugly that we create all these objects, and then when the answer comes in, we go, oh, never mind, and we create different objects. It's, it it's would have been cleaner ugly. to maybe just do it at, when the answer comes no, in. We don't, it, we, don't, so we don't create different objects. We throw away the ones we don't need. It, it turned out we didn't need. OK. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, and, and uh, the code pen works in, in Chrome. But it the the it may be ugly, but it's it's needed to uh, fully represent what can happen for for the not bundling being rejected use case, and um, and I think we should just live with that because this is what's implemented PR and it, yeah. it already works and it makes sense. So that's uh -huh. the proposal is to revert them. Yep. Yeah, I think I'll defer to those who have implemented this, and uh, I agree. Well, we're trying to implement it. That's we just <laughs> want to clarify this. <laughs> yeah. Well, the bundling okay. confusing is already uh, is, confusion is already implemented. The the bug in the spec is that when you do rollback, uh, according to spec, you you'll have these transports that don't map to anything in JSEP because right. you never cleaned it up. So that that's the PR. And okay. So let's record the decision and go to the next slide. So similar problem here, right? Um, so the, in, in our previous slide, we decided that the receive codex are something that you set on offer. So this should sound similar to the previous slide. Well, if you if you have something that's on offer, rollback needs to revert it. Right. Uh, so 
yeah, and, and we need to do this with the receive codex because of early media. We don't need to do this with the send codex because send codex is only updated when you set the answer, meaning you go back to stable state. So it only applies for the receive codex. Uh, the proposal is to, yeah, revert the value. Yeah. Yeah, it works for me. Okay. All right. So we've okay. accepted this one. Okay. Accept this and oh right. So well, there's here's the question though. Like, considering we have, <laughs> oh, no. uh, <laughs> I almost forgot. So, okay. well, now that we're reverting this beautiful internal slot, that means if you do get parameters and then you do rollback and then you do set parameters, the parameters will have changed. This is why I like mm -hmm. Geniverse. Uh, Thing right. where we don't support asynchronous uh, stuff because then this issue becomes a non-issue. That's uh, why I moved the slide ahead. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Good. So <laughs> this is this is already solved. Uh, but uh, otherwise, I would suggest that we add a um, you know we clarify the perfect negotiation example with how to protect against this. But not needed. I think we can go to the next slide. Okay. Um. And then uh, this is also part of uh, thinking about what happens when you do an, uh, when you do rollback. And one of the things that you can do is restart ice, which means that in this case, PC one uh, is is uh, wants to restart ice. It starts generating new candidates, um, but then it it needs to roll back because it receives an offer from the other endpoint. Um, what would happen, like, because the other endpoint has just sent you an offer, it's the, uh, it's an unpolite peer that will mean that it, it won't have set the offer that you just rolled back. Which means if it tries to do add ice candidate with the new candidates you generated, that will throw an exception. Mm. Um, so I looked at this and I thought, oh, is this a problem? Uh, do we need to document it? And then, uh, with discussions with Geneva, uh, base it's it turns out this this is uh, this is not special for rollback. This is already case if you uh, the case if you have uh, multiple incoming offers and offer collisions. Um, so I think this is a, like a possible foot gun, but it it's for rollback purposes. I think we can close this issue and. Considering we've already filed an issue to add uh, an example about how to do perfect negotiation, I think we should just make sure that that example uh, takes this into account. But my proposal is we close this issue. There's no issue with rollback and ICE restarts. Yeah, uh, if I could try to clarify. That. So this is not unique to ICE restarts. Uh, so we can close this issue. There is, um, and nothing really goes wrong. There's a case where you get noisy errors from add ice candidate if you implement the polite and impolite uh, perfect negotiation strategy. And so I, I opened another issue to uh, the spec right now does not talk about perfect negotiation because mm. it's not really an issue for implementers. But it might be a good idea to at least add an example of how to do perfect perfect negotiation. And there uh, we would be able to explain how to work around this. Uh, and the only way to work around it right now, unless we want to add change the spec more, is to basically let JavaScript handle this. Uh, the issue is, briefly explained, uh, if you're the impolite peer, uh, that means just if impolite, then return, uh, basically ignore incoming offers. And uh, because it, we never set that offer on the peer connection object, the peer connection object has no way to to to, to know what the would-be offer would have been, and it doesn't have enough information to then silence any incoming candidates from that offer. So the JavaScript would need a Boolean that basically say, I just ignored the remote description, so add ice a candidate may now produce failures for a couple of seconds, because there are probably candidates coming in after that offer. So, but I don't think we need to discuss that here. Uh, other, but if, uh, I would like to add an example on perfect, perfect negotiation in the spec. I, I do think the spec deserves a, a perfect negotiation example uh, because it's yeah it's it's quite complicated and and there's there's like there's one way to use the APIs perfectly and then there's a million ways to do it incorrectly. So. Right. 
Uh, so it's good if that's actually in part of the spec and not part of uh, a blog post. <laughs> yeah. Well, it can also be a part of a blog post. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, but I, uh, I think we have agreement to close this one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do we have consensus that an example? Or do I need one? So, what did you ask? Uh, do we have consensus to add an example, or does that is that needed? Yes. Yes. Go okay. go do it. Great. Okay. Next slide. So the RTC error. Um, so today, like uh, the spec says, to throw an RTC error, which is a DOM exception. Uh, but today's implementation throws a mostly operation error. It seems. So if you if you inspect the JavaScript. The object, you'll see the name operation error, with messages, and stack. I don't know, for some reason, stack and messages, the same thing. Um, so this is what this is what you see. Uh, but the spec says you should do an RTC error, which looks different than uh, as, as illustrated here. The name is RTC error, uh, right. and it also has additional fields. And the additional fields, they're like, they're nice to have. They're, they're unlikely to cause backwards compatibility issues but if people inspect the name um, that would be probably be a hurdle um, so the proposal is to to still to still have this RTC error but that the RTC error constructs itself with the a backwards compatible name uh -huh. um, and and I, I need to look at the details if this can always be operation error or if we need to have different operation uh, different names used here. I think probably we can just always hard code this to operation error. Um, but I, I need to look into that. The, the point is, are we okay with uh, RTC error using a different name than RTC error uh, for itself? That's uh, that's the proposal. Yeah. And then, then the well, then the the just to point out, no one's actually implemented these. So the question is, do we need to mark the the additional fields as at risk? Yeah, we probably do. So 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 so, <laughs> Enric, you're saying that operation error is the the name that is used in all browsers, basically. So uh, Chrome, Firefox. As well. and that, that's what I need to uh, try out in practice. I didn't have time, but uh, it looks like most most when I searched around in Chromium, it looks like op operation error is okay. the thing. Yeah. But uh, yeah, um, the the point of this, uh, the assumption uh, that if we want to do this is that this actually solves solves compatibility issues. Mm -hmm. So I, I this is. Uh, Assuming we do have uh, uh, names that are, are interoperable already and we don't want to change them. Yeah, the goal here is to align it's with implementations. But if implementations right. don't agree, then we can't solve that, obviously. Yeah. Well, well I mean, we could, we could still basically say you use the existing name and have the additional fields, so. Yes. <clears throat> OK, so. Uh, I support we, both of these. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, th I think we have to. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Um, uh, so next step is to make a PR, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Next one. Uh, Weber to see stats. <laughs> so this is uh, just a matter of, uh, I would call it, uh, Elegance. I mean, when I looked at data, RTC data channel stats, for instance, it has a data channel identifier field. And without it, you wouldn't know which uh, data channel you were talking about. And uh, I mean, it, it would simply be a mean, meaningless stat. And so other stats are uh, do have fields that can be missing. For instance, the channel count in RTC codec stats, the only place you want to use it at the moment is for stereo uh, audio. When you have video or you have mono, you just skip the field. Mm. So it's just a matter of uh, 
making the spec easy to read to so say that in these cases you add, you add the word required to the dictionary. Mm -hmm. And I think that's editorial. There's I, no code changes in the clients and no code changes in the it, it, in the spec. So it might I think we should uh, should do this, but I think but I, I don't see that we need to do it before CR. It might allow you to um, to write more precise tests, I guess. So, which is it would it would document. I mean, as I said, the, these are fields that for which the the stats are already meaningless without them. So, the tests can already test test that they are present. But uh, it certainly allows you to automate some testing. Yeah. A any objections to this? Well, the only problem might be with. Uh, non-mandatory stats that are required. Uh, is that confusing? Is confusing no, answer? I mean, uh, these are, th this is just suggesting members of individual stats dictionaries. Right. Yes, so but not all members are. Uh, the, I mean, if you produce this stat, uh, you have to include this field. If you don't produce this right. stat, it, uh, it has no relevance. Yeah, right. that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, I like it. Okay. Yeah. I'll take it as, as so, accepted, and we'll uh, put it on the back for to, to be done after CR. Okay. That's good. Um, oh, yeah. Network type. Okay. So we are back to uh, the network type discussion. Um, so probably everybody remembers that um, the network type stat has privacy issues. Um, it's, it has no consensus between implementers, so it has shipped in, in some browsers, but not all of them. So clearly, this particular stat is uh, not as mature as other stats. When, when we started to discuss um, this part particular stat, it was not clear whether uh, the use cases could be um, fulfilled with uh, more private neutral stats or not. Um, so clearly we could try to improve uh, this particular stat based on uh, more precise use cases and maybe come up with a solution that could ship in all browsers. Um, currently it's not the case. So I believe it's uh, not like all other stats. So my proposal is to move move this stat to the extension spec that we just agreed to have in a WebRTC working group um, and continue working on it as, as, um, progressively. This does not require any change to implementations. So implementations shipping it currently would still be compliant and implementations not shipping it would still be compliant as well. Um, and once it's in the extension spec, we could refine it. So. Uh, maybe we can find more focused solutions. Maybe we can remove some values, so reduce the granularity. Maybe we can reduce uh, the exposure of this stat. Uh, only if get is granted, only for the selected candidate pair. There, there are different ideas there. But um, yeah, I think we, we should try to uh, work on it uh, in parallel. So that's a proposal. <coughs> So we do uh, we do have an experimental stats document which is also living in one of Henrik Henrik's repo. Oh, okay. So maybe should we should adopt it. <laughs> and if you think it's an it, it is an in an adoptable state, the the WebRTC uh, uh, the the my other the extension ex stack experimental stats repo. Yeah, I'm thinking that the general uh, WebRTC to see uh, uh, repo with extensions repo isn't the rest place. So yeah, I I think I think so. We've put stuff there. I mean, let's just quick look. Uh, right. So it contains content type, and the reason we put it there was because content type was. This, uh, right, it, it mostly contains stats that are well-defined, but, um, but we weren't sure if they were useful, so we didn't want to add them to the main stats. 
or it contains this content type one, which is based on a RTP header extension, which again is well defined, but it hasn't been uh, published uh, as an as an as a draft. It's on the um, right. Basically, yes. The short answer is is yes. I think we can re we can adopt it and uh, and refine it. It's. Okay, so that's the proposal. Okay. Cool. Could we agree to adopt it? No, we adopted two, yeah. two specs yeah. today. Hooray. Okay. Good. So uh, clearly we're, we're going to remove the uh, move the network type to the extension spec? Yep. Yes. Okay. Okay, media capture and streams. <coughs> okay, um, so the Ping working group uh, filed an issue saying um, given enumerated er devices is leaking uh, fingerprinting immersion, it should be behind a permission prompt. Um, so we, we, we made some efforts to limit uh, the provi provided information uh, by default. Uh, so currently, uh, the spec is mandating to expose at most one device of each type, no device ID. And then if get user media is called, then we, we will provide all, all available information. Um, there, there are a few cases where we could actually try to strengthen the model and make it as if the enumerated devices is behind a prompt. So one possibility is to remove device information and the other is to expose no device information at all by default. So next slide. So the first item is to remove device info permission. Uh, why should we do that? So one of the issue is that uh, usually you, you can have a website where uh, you will um, take a, a photo, so you will grant get user media access. And the website will use the camera to take a photo and that's all. Then on next visits, um, since get user media was granted, the device info permission is granted, and then the device info permission is granted for uh, basically um, a long time. So on user next visits, uh, the user did not grant access to camera, but the website knows all about your device setup. So clearly that's not great. And we could try to improve things without breaking uh, stuff. Uh, the second issue, is that device info permission is really difficult to understand. Um, I believe that no browser is exposing it to user because nobody found a good way to uh, um, de describe it in a, in, a, in a meaningful way to users. So it's not controllable by users. Users cannot actually say, oh, I want to remove device info permission or I want to grant device info permission. They can grant camera microphones, but not the device info permission. Also, uh, we, we also tried uh, internally to expose some API to uh, be able to uh, um, expose device info permission, and it was actually a nightmare. So it's not only users, it's also uh, developers that are uh, not able to understand this permission. Also, uh, this permission is no longer really needed, right? Uh, the expected flow, the flow that we actually want to enforce is to call get user media first, and then you, you, you call any more devices. And uh, most pages will anyway need to do that uh, for the first time you visit and for uh, other cases as well. So I think we should uh, simplify the spec and simplify all of this by replacing the device info permission by, by just an internal slot that is stored on the page. So the slot, uh, so there's a PR for it, uh, 641. The slot uh, on the page would be denied by default, which means that you do not expose any information by default, and it's granted after one su successful get user media call on that page. If the page goes away, the slot goes away, and you, if you need to get all device info permission, you will need to call get user media again. Um, as a side note, um, this slot can still be um, modified. So if it's granted, it can go to denied by the user agent during the lifetime of the page. Uh, there are at least two, um, two use cases that I'm aware of where it might be useful. 
is when the user is explicitly revoking access. So it will stop capture and it will uh, deny access uh, to the page. So there it makes sense to uh, revoke device info uh, access as well. And the second case is when the page is not capturing long time, for instance, uh, the user agent could proactively say, uh, you will need to be prompted again for get to the media, so you will, uh, you, you will not get access to device info permission anymore. Um, so that's it for the proposal. Right, so I, I think I, I, I like the intent. Um, I'm a little concerned that it's not expandable, so and that uh, it would be hard for other specifications to extend this to, for example, speaker devices, just to use an example. Even right. if we end up doing something different for that, having yeah, the ex Yeah, the plan yeah. is to do something different, right? So I was wondering if we could get the same effect by, instead of having an internal slot, we already have language on enumerate devices to filter out camera and microphone based on feature policy. So I'm wondering if we could express the, the same net effect uh, by modifying it there. So what? what so, so basically, it only expose mm -hmm. camera devices. You know, filter out all camera devices that don't have permission. So I, I don't. I don't think. It, I think actually it's extendable. Uh, if you set uh, an internal slot uh, on the page, right. uh, another another spec mm -hmm. can say, "Oh, this slot actually we change it to that value in that in that, in those cases." And, right. Uh, yeah, it might be. It's, it's just as, need to... as simple as adding a feature policy and. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see the benefit there of feature policy, but maybe no, no. I'm seeing something. I, I'm, I'm saying we already have language, I believe, for, for feature policy, where if a, if an iframe oh. only has a microphone exposed, you only get microphones in enumerate devices, I believe. Yeah, we, we had it. So, so I, I'm saying we could do the, uh, we could do, we could accomplish the same thing here by saying don't expose cameras that don't have permission. Right. And that, I think um, we'll give you the same thing. Yeah, except except yours works for the speaker too, Anibar. <laughs> right, and then a speaker device, a speaker extension spec could then say the same thing for speakers. Um, uh, <clears throat> just uh, just for op sake of uh, iterating options, you you could also have uh, two different permissions and say if either get used to media permission or device info permission is granted, then. Mm -hmm. Right, but uh, the, the but thing it, is, yeah. device info permission is granted. Uh, so the idea is that it's scoped by the page, right? Uh, it's not something that that is uh, not well defined and, and that ends up being uh, implemented one way in a browser and another way in another browser, and then you you have like vast, vastly different uh, behaviors. That's not the, the idea of the PR is to have like something that is. Uh, very consistent, easy to implement, and uh, well, developers will understand it. <coughs> right, and it may be that. Um, so I agree with the overall intent, and uh, the maybe extendability could be done simply by calling, uh, making a definition, uh, you know, in a bold that mm -hmm. where exactly. we set the uh, internal slot, and then other specs can call it that way. Right, and usually we, we do that when uh, another spec is requiring this kind of extension. Uh, I'm fine building building it uh, right now, but that's fine as well to be future proof. Okay. Okay. Like so uh, sounds like we agree. So we should just like update the PR and and take it from there. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm a little bit sad about it, but uh, it seems to make that make life simpler. Simpler is good. My okay. Point. Next slide. So, um, so now that we have uh, uh, removed this, there's still the fact that we are leaking, um, or we are we are allowing some implementations to leak whether a camera or microphone is available on a given system. Uh, the information might be useful. It's not clear to me it's actually useful. Uh, no, it might be useful. It's not actually clear to me whether it's actually used by web pages or not. Um, so that I don't know. If uh, the page can have a de dedicated UI, if there's uh, capture devices or not. So, for instance, show that uh, um, 
a red icon if there's a capture devices and, and not and not show it if there's no capture devices. Um, I'm not sure web pages are doing it right now. So, but still, uh, there's this potential issue. Um, so, there are different potential solutions. Uh, we could mandate to enumerate always one camera and one microphone. And when you call get, you, uh, get to the media, you are actually uh, emulating the fact that your camera is gone just at the same time. Uh, we could make enumerate devices return an empty list. And then we would need to provide a way to run the different UIs like CSS properties or something like that. Um, it's not clear to me yet what we should do. Or maybe we should at the end of the day just kill enumerate devices and be done with it. So my proposal for um, WebRC 1.0, basically it's a status quo, meaning that the spec allows user agents to not leak any information. And the spec allows user agents to leak some very limited uh, amount of information. And uh, post track, I hope we can continue working on it and uh, fixing the issue. Um, I, I want to discuss it because uh, the Ping Working Group will probably uh, come to us and say, hey, that's this issue. So it, it would be good that we have uh, consensus on what we want for this version of the spec. I didn't hear what Harl said, sorry. Oh, I think that this makes sense. I mean, uh, it uh, it's convoluted, both uh, knowing that uh, what we do it has some degree of backwards compatibility and, and knowing that uh, and trying to, to figure out what uh, requirements are reasonable to to consider. So, so I'm in favor of not uh, not trying to hurry up on this one. Right. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I think I agree. Uh, there's some value, I think, in we've gotten this on um, screen capture as well, that websites don't want to have a button for screen capture if screen pack capture doesn't work, which happens on Android devices, for example. So knowing whether uh, you can ask the user for camera or microphone or not as a concept, I think is useful. And uh, the spec does allow uh, user agents to turn off this behavior and, and basically where the user gets to say, yeah, I know I have a camera and microphone, but I choose never to use those and not reveal that because I don't want to reveal that to websites. That's a user choice. Um, I kind of like I kind of like this either just rejecting or or uh, returning an empty list, unless we know that we're breaking a lot of websites. Yeah. Uh, initially, we, we were thinking about the empty list, using the empty list, but we were not sure whether it would break the uh, web pages or not. Um, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know at all um, whether it, it, it would be web compatible or not. I, yeah, I would like to find that out because I mean, if 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 we don't have permissions to show you a list of devices, then we should shouldn't pretend that we do, um, unless they think right. I mean, unless we think that the uh, the the ping working group will agree to exposing this. But I got the impression that they are not happy. <laughs> With <laughs> exposing any of this stuff, and I don't see a very compelling use case to actually, like, yeah, it's backwards compatible, but it's not really a use case that I would like to support. So unless we have data saying this will break the web, mm -hmm. I think we should just fix the mistake. Okay. But um, that, that's based on not knowing uh, uh, how this is used in the real world. But uh, when you say I, I use think, case, like having a button. Yeah. But, do you mean having a button for camera and microphone? Yeah. Uh, uh, websites that will uh, not show uh, camera button. Uh, on. Um, I haven't seen uh, that kind of UI in big websites. So, yeah, me, me neither. And, 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 and so, so the easy way to find find out a little bit more would be to hack a browser to not 
to return an empty list and then uh, pull up uh, five or more popular chat applications and see if you can actually get in. Or even throw an exception, but that one might be more risky. Like, like Firefox already has a Firefox already has a pref for this, uh, which is used by Tor browsers and others, where we do create fake devices. Yeah. But um, creating fake devices is, is different from returning empty lists. Yeah. I mean, uh, returning empty list is the thing that might not be web compatible. Right. Because it would, uh, co it, it would be identical to present behavior if you, in fact, have no devices. Uh, I, I can take the action to actually uh, hack uh, WebKit, uh, return the empty list, and go to a few uh, popular uh, Yeah. Sites. Can you but, can you go but, one but step? I, I'm, not, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure I will end up saying, hey, it's working. But, can you uh, go one <laughs> step? Uh, it will be sufficient you go? for the working group to actually agree that, yeah, we can do it. Uh, I don't yeah. know. I, I have actually, I went to talkie.io on a cell phone where I didn't have Android permission for camera and microphone. And it would not let me turn on camera or microphone because the way it tested. I had to go to a different web page that just called Get User Media. And then I got the OS prompt. And then I went back to talkie and then I could click the buttons. I think they were using some mechanism for detecting probably in the right devices uh, whether to ask at all. Uh, suggestion, suggestion, throw an exception, because it would be really obvious uh, to a website that, hey, I'm doing something I'm not allowed to do, rather than, oh, the user doesn't have a camera or microphone. That is the same, that same, same solution as uh, moving it. Move enumerated devices bit behind the behind the permission, yeah. and move the whole call behind the permission. Yeah, I mean, and that's a breaking that's a breaking change for sure. I mean, we might not care about most of the cases that break, but it's a breaking change. Yeah. So. Um... So I, I I definitely go for doing go for doing experiments to back up for how what it breaks. Post, post right. yeah. And so, I think uh, I'd like. Uh, how many more issues do we have today? We've a couple. Minutes left. Yeah. Ten minutes. Yeah. Left. So I think we need to move on. Okay. Uh, I'll take an action to do that. That said, uh, Safari is not uh, supported in all uh, WebRTC websites, so it would be cool if uh, uh, some people on Chrome could do could do it as well in websites that only support Chrome. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, uh, uh, issue 639. Uh, so it, it would have been nice if we uh, actually enforced user gesture for get user media uh, from the start. Um, we cannot do it anymore. It's probably not web compatible to mandate it, but it would still be good to try to, uh, to enforce it in a few, in a few cases. Uh, one issue that uh, I was made aware by web developers is uh, the case where a user enters a video call, user denies camera microphone access uh, initially because they only want to uh, listen. And later on, the user actually wants to ask a question. So they, they want to turn the microphone. But of course, if you call that user media, it will be denied. Uh, so the current solutions they have is basically to reload the page. It works in Safari, um, probably in Firefox as well. You can uh, provide hints to the user to reset permission uh, using the browser UI. Uh, so that, that should work in Chrome and Firefox, uh, probably in Safari as well, in for, for an edge case. But still, it's, it's, it's not great. Um, so one proposal I have is that if get user media is triggered by a user gest gesture and permission is denied, we set permission to prompt and proceed. Um, the scope we, we are planning to do in Safari is to only um, um, override the permission for temporary permissions. Uh, and temporary permissions is a concept that uh, exists in Firefox and Safari. Basically, it's permissions uh, whose lifetime is the page. I don't think Chrome has such concept. 
Um, I think Chrome always yeah. stores the, stores the result of the get of the accept or deny. Right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I wanted to discuss this proposal. I'm not sure uh, if there's any spec change, or maybe we could uh, provide some spec changes. But uh, what do you think? Yeah. I was going to ask: Is there anything in the spec that prevents Safari from doing this now? Uh, I think it's fine. Because yeah. There's no concept yeah. of uh, uh, temporary permissions, right? Right. There, there's a concept of a one-time permission that um, and uh, privacy indicators that have to go away when the last track is stopped um, for live indicator, and there's a separate accessible indicator for permission. But that's all it says. Yeah. While uh, while permissions and prompts and all that stuff is is um, somewhere in between spec and and up to the browser, I I do think like it, that's an like whether or not you display a prompt, I think will influence whether or not people call the API. So I do think all the browsers should should do the same, and the spec should like I like this. Well. I don't know that we're suggesting anything here. So, uh, you know, if there's no PR, I would like to move on. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe you can move on for this one as well. Or do you want to talk about it? Uh, yeah. Um, okay. I don't know. I think we can skip it. Okay. So the, there's one there's one thing about, uh, about uh, rolling back to permission. It is. Uh, lo lo rolling back to prompt, which is that I fear the loop that says, hey, hey, give us permission to the camera. No. Give us permission to the camera. No. Give us permission to yeah. the camera. How do you get yeah. out of the loop? Uh, and I commented an issue that you know this would remove the only incentive to not spam on page load, <laughs> is that I, you would actually risk being blocked. Yeah. Um, if, if you have a user click, um, then the only way the user can probably uh, do things is probably to uh, close the page. And the right. user will be able to close the page, or the user will be able to deny always. And in that case, it will not, it will not be prompted mm -hmm. anymore. So right. there are two, two, two solutions there. The user agents can already uh, uh, you know, work on the best. I don't know that we know the best behavior yet, so I don't think a spec should necessarily come in and say it knows the best way. I think experimentation here is good. <coughs> All right. Do I have five minutes for <laughs> my slides? <coughs> Just about. Yeah, go ahead. All right. So basically, uh, the ping opened another issue, which was only reveal labels of devices users have given permission to, um, <coughs> because the prim privacy climate has changed, basically. Um, <laughs> And this goes beyond fingerprinting um, and that exposing info on all of a user's devices beyond the granted ones uh, also reveals actual private information the user didn't intend to share about what they own and what they have plugged in. <laughs> Next slide. But hold on. Uh, which devices has user given permission to? And so I actually found out in both Safari and Chrome when it says the site wants to use your camera and microphone, it's actually cameras and microphones, plural. So you're sharing all your devices. It means that not revealing labels would have no meaningful, no meaningful difference in Safari or Chrome. Firefox, on the other hand, <clears throat> by default, um, only gives you one-time permission to one device. Now, to be fair, if you do click the Remember This Decision, we also grant to all devices. Uh, next page. <clears throat> so the issue here is Firefox shares all labels instead of all devices. So if we take the ping request literally, it would uh, only make Firefox non-compliant, which is the most private option, and forcing it actually to weaken its privacy to comply if it wants to implement in content device selection, or it would need it would suffer a prompt like this, where you just get question marks for the other devices. <clears throat> so um, I kind of view this as p ping saying, people can see in the window, when the reality is that three out of four houses are missing a wall, where people just can see in and walk in. So I think what Ping really means here is that they want a privacy by default flow, which they posted in the issue, where the site asks for a category or category of devices. 
And then the browser prompts the user for one, many, or all of the devices. And then the site gains access to only the device and label of hardware that the user selects. So Firefox mostly does this already by default, but others do not. And so next slide is how do we, how did we get here? <clears throat> Why do we expose all labels? To make in-content device selection possible. And here are two examples from uh, Hangouts and uh, uh, Parents. <laughs> and as far as I know, there's no other reason. And it's not terribly exciting to see these selectors that, you know, they're not terribly exciting after seven years of re revealing all this information. They're basically just glorified pickers. The next slide. <clears throat> in hindsight, this could have been done in Chrome, meaning the browser could prompt instead. And here are a couple of prompts that are just modeled on the success of Get Display Media, where we do exactly that. <clears throat> and in Chrome selectors, remove the need to grant all devices. And uh, there may be other reasons to grant all devices, but this was, I think, a primary motivator because you want to be able to, and this is still clunky in Firefox, in content device selection, you pick a device in the list, and then Firefox also prompts. You get two prompts. Some other benefits of this is that for on desktop, user agents can now implement previews for all choices, even non-choice ones. For instance, you could put all the cameras <laughs> up in the grid. You might want to not want to do that on the initial prompt because it could scare users. But on reselecting, on changing your device, that might be useful. On mobile, it can actually be tricky because most mobile devices don't. Uh, the hardware doesn't allow you to open one more than one device at a time. And there are tricks that a browser can do that are hard to get right, like temporarily mute the current device in order to show a preview of a different device, stuff like that. Next slide. So this is a hard problem that uh, we've currently foisted on sites, and they haven't been very productive. <clears throat> but then counter argument, most users have one camera, or they have an easily distinguishable front or back camera, which you can use. Websites can use constraints to find that one. So uh, for most users, having a selector is too much information. So Firefox is worse on that one. Next slide. So how do we solve this? <clears throat> so one solution is obvious is to have a dedicated uh, in, uh, user experience in the browser for users with a single device versus multiple <laughs> devices. So a dedicated in Chrome device selector when the user has multiple devices. Mm -hmm. So this proposal here, PR644, is to mandate a selector in GUM, get user media, <clears throat> like Firefox has unless the constraints provided reduce to one device. So this would mean the following changes if we consider a user which previously has persisted permission for camera. If you just call get user media video true, you only get granted if the user has only one camera. Uh, otherwise, you get a selector. If you specify facing mode, this is how Firefox works already. Uh, uh, constraints are ideal by default, so that doesn't you still get a selector in Firefox. Uh, the benefit is that the user-facing camera is now just the default choice in that selector. Uh, the same thing with the device ID. And the we're at time. Or not, go ahead. Yeah, what happens if uh, you're in prompt and then the user is saying, oh, I actually want to plug in a camera? You want to? The user will actually plug in a camera because, oh, no, <clears> that's <throat> not the one I want. You know. And well, then, uh, so Ideally, the user thing. agent should update the, the list, right? But but, it, but you're going from prompt to selector, then? Mm. Well, Firefox implements the selector in the prompt, right? So just like for Get Display Media, the prompt is the selector, right? So it's, it's saying uh, the site wants to use your camera, and here you get to pick which camera or microphone. So. The, uh, the, the, but the, the last line in this table here is where you specify an exact device ID, for instance, with a, an exact constraint. In that case, it's clear that the website is only asking for a specific device, and that reduces to uh, approve or deny. So browsers could have, Firefox could have a much simpler user interface in that case, um, and, but it doesn't at the moment. It still gives you a, a quite noisy selector. So, um, Again, I, for the last case, I, I would prefer uh, a picker as well, so that as a user, mm -hmm. I would know which camera uh, I will grant. If I have two camera, then having uh, a presentation of what will be uh, shown to uh, the web page is actually nice. Mm -hmm. so sure. I, I like mean, the idea of a selector. It, so the, the reason well, I don't like this one, I mean, speaking because it's a last minute, uh, mm -hmm. is that uh, it breaks 
currently deployed use cases. Well, uh, because in the case where you have two cameras and your and and your your current deployment uh, is consistent about pick, picking the better camera, you you in fact have. Uh, useful behavior that the user has gotten used to and the co and the programmer has has allowed for now the, now with this it would uh, it it would prop up pop, pop up a selector in the middle of the flow that is entirely gratuitous mm. since the, it but already has access, access to all the cameras there's no permission involved and, uh, and the previous selection of the of, that the browser did was consistent for that browser and those those cameras. So we're introducing, to my mind, another step in the in, in the startup flow with uh, no benefit that I can see. Well, the benefit is that I personally see some benefits. I agree that uh, we we have to think a lot about. Out, uh, this particular model because there are some potential regulations that we, we need to fix. So it's, but, uh, but I but think to clarify, we should try. To clarify, I don't think this breaks any, uh, any um, if it hangouts and implements a picker, has to use the exact device constraint if it wants to avoid a really weird, awkward behavior in Firefox. And I believe it already does. So if you already know which device the user last used last time, you pass that in, right? And then yeah. it just works like before. Uh, am, only, I, uh, the, yeah. am I correct to say that? Oh, sorry. Go on. I, I just meant to say that the, the only weirdness here is that the current prompts that are vague don't actually tell you which camera you're sharing. And this would force browsers to to uh, ex uh, include that in the prompt. So, so, so we, it, the principal side of the thing is that we're try I think we're stepping over the edge from uh, of uh, uh, stepping too far in, into the into the area of uh, specs, trying to mandate user interfaces. Yeah. Well, the the goal would be for the spec. If the ping, in order to satisfy the ping, it has to be the. If you see, I changed the title here from not the only reveal labels of devices user has chosen, because in, in all the edge case, in all the tricky cases here, it wasn't the user that chose the device; it was the browser. So that's what this gets at. So uh, it doesn't try to mandate how to do uh, your UX. It mandates uh, that you're, you fairly ask the user so that what device has been granted is clear and meaningful. And right now, it's not. So uh, I, I think we're out of time, right? Yeah. We're, right. Uh, we are. So I, I, ju I just want to mention that uh, if, you, if you're just requesting camera, probably the prompt is only about camera, right? in all browsers. But still, we are uh, no. exposing all the microphones, and we should not. And that, we should fix it. Okay. So, so this would of... only apply when, when <laughs> you, you've supplied constraints where multiple devices could potentially apply because yes. it's not exact so mm -hmm. so instead of the tiebreaker being completely up to the browser you're saying that the the tiebreaker is the decision actually picks in a selector menu which camera to open well either the site is asking for a particular device or it's asking for uh, one of the user to pick a device and you could already know that by calling enumerate devices to get the number of devices was the idea here and the benefit of all this is that we could retire label from enumerate devices entirely Yep, it would be nice to uh, remove labels. I I still think that uh, thinking that the web page is nice and will uh, force a specific uh, device selection uh, is a potential issue to the ping working group. Mm. Right. So I think at minimum the, the user agents that uh, grant all devices should say so in the prompt and. Mm -hmm. um, Yes. We have had and it's tricky years. because, yes. Yeah. Right. And I get tricky because uh, all it may be all devices at the time that the prompt is shown because you haven't plugged in anything, but you can plug in something after the fact. And it, access, it has access to that too. Yep. So it's all current and future cameras.
in this session? All cameras. Right. Well, in Chrome, it's persistent, so it's all cameras forever. Yeah, until you revoke. Yep. OK, our time is up. Yep. All right. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. OK. I will stop recording.